Welcome to a well-designed business with your host, Luan Nigara. Luan has a lifetime of experience building a multi-million dollar business with her husband and cousin, and she knows the challenges you face in your interior design business. Luann brings you real-life answers to your most pressing problems, as well as practical strategies to explode your interior design business. So, let's get to the business of interior design. Hi, welcome to another episode of A Well-Designed Business. Today on the show, we're talking about art the importance of art to your interior design projects, and how important expert framing of that art is. I thought the conversation might be a little teaser for you to help you think about how and why you might incorporate fine art into your interior design projects. If it's not your normal protocol, fine art might be a bit intimidating to specify. So this discussion centers on the value of a trusted vendor, in this case, an expert framer, who's there to help you be successful in this area. Just like a kitchen expert or a window treatment expert that you rely on for advice during your projects, the expert framer is one more colleague for you to rely on. And what better way than to have this conversation with an artist alongside his favorite framer. So my guests today are Paul Paul Thomas, a renowned artist, and Daniel Beauchemin, an accomplished interior designer and the owner of the famous Chelsea Frames here in New York City. A little background about each of these men. Paul Thomas is perhaps best described as an artist of intuition. His paintings are composed through a natural path of creation rather than some institutionalized formal analysis. In fact, Paul's work is a lot like his personality. It's bright, it's cheerful, it's filled with an interior radiance, it's full of movement and vitality. And it is very hard to really appreciate Paul's work through online viewing or catalog viewing because you really miss the translucence of the color, and I recommend if you ever have the opportunity to see it in person that you take advantage of it. Paul's work is in public and private collections in the U.S., Canada, France, Italy, and South America. Some of the highlight collections include the U.S. Consulate in Florence, Italy, the Museum of Contemporary Art in Bologna, the Louis Azaro Collection, the NYU Langone Medical Center, Montefiore Medical Center, Boston Scientific World Headquarters, Holiday House 2013, 2014, and 2015, Kipps Bay Decorator Show House 2015. In 2016, Paul won Best in Show at the Architectural Digest Design Show. He collaborated with Charles Pavarini on that show, and in episode number 16 of this podcast, you can hear Charles describe that whole collaboration in great detail. In 2017, Paul's work became the, the exclusive art for Haru restaurants here in New York City. He has collaborated with many interior designers, including Charles Pavarini, Robin Barron, James Rixner, Alan Tanksley, John Eason, Bonnie Steves, Claudia Giselle, Stacey Garcia, Deborah Martin, and Laura Cray. Now, a little bit about Daniel. Daniel grew up in a home where design was central and part of his daily life. He was graced with a multicultural environment and he was exposed not only to Canadian, American, and European culture at home, but his parents' circle of friends spanned the globe. So from an early age, he grew an eclectic taste for all things that are beautifully designed. His studies included architecture with a focus on furniture design, as well as art history and interiors. After working with notable New York City interior design firms, he opened his own firm in 1996, running this until 2009. During this time, he was introduced to Chelsea Frames, which he actually purchased in 1995, and it became the focus of his work. By 2009, it had become one of the most renowned framing studios in the USA with customers all around the globe. He left there for a while, working and designing for Larson Jewels, but after seven years, he rejoined his partner, Jacqueline Acker, full-time in Chelsea Frames, where he continues to work daily with clients, collectors, and designers. So, a quick break to t- hear a little bit about our sponsor, and I'll be right back with Paul Thomas and Daniel Beauchemin. I'd like to thank my sponsor, Cherish, and to let you know about this gem of a resource. Cherish, which can be found at www.cherish.com. 
Realtor.com slash trade is the premier online marketplace where design pros just like you can go to source the best vintage decor and furniture. With more than 125,000 curated items for sale, Cherish makes it easy, fun, and fast for you to find stylish pieces at great deals to suit every client and every project. The items are ready to ship, hint, hint, which means no waiting, and Cherish offers a two-day return policy. Here's some more good stuff. Cherish trade members enjoy special benefits, including cash back on every purchase, white glove delivery, and exclusive concierge service. Sign up for their trade program today at www.cherish.com slash trade. Hi, Paul. Hi, Daniel. Welcome to A Well-Designed Business. Hey, Luann. It's Paul. Thanks so much. Hey, Luann. So happy to be here. Thank you. I am happy to have both of you guys on the show. Of course, Paul and I know each other for several years. We were first connected through our famous and lovely friend, Mr. Pavarini of Pavarini Design in New York City when we did the Ronald McDonald House with him, right? We were both vendors on his project out in Long Island. Yes, that was my first collaboration with Charles Pavarini, and since then we've done many projects, including Kipps Bay and Architectural Design Show. So, I know. Yes, we go back. Yeah, yeah. and I love that because that was when Pavarini, but Charles says to me, um, you know, you're not going to have the fabric yet. It's coming in a little bit. And I was like, well, what's the repeat? He's like, well, there's no repeat. And I'm like, well, you know, you need this many yards. He's like, it's not in yards. It's in panels. I'm like, what the heck are you getting me? And he goes, well, I found this amazing artist, and he's hand painting the fabric exclusively and creating it, silk screening it for us for the Ronald McDonald house. I was like, what? Like this man, the things he comes up with, (laughs) but it was amazing. And that was where I was introduced to your art. And then of course you're right. I then saw it at Kipps Bay and then the architectural digest show, which Charles was on and talked about. And so now Paul, you reached out to me and you are suggesting this collaboration with Daniel. And I'm very excited about it because at first you guys both know, I was kind of like, I don't get it, but I get it now. I have just had, I'm going to let everybody know that I've just had about a 10 minute conversation with Daniel and Uh, Paul and Daniel explaining to me a whole aspect of our industry that I had not considered. So the thing is this, I said in the introduction that Daniel is an interior designer, but he's also the owner of Chelsea Frames, which is, you know, nationally known framing location in New York City. And there is some unique things happening in this perspective for you guys from a business standpoint. And what I've just learned and what I want to express to you is that we need to seriously consider the framer as another one of our vendors in our team, just like the window treatment person is a vendor, just like the tiler is a vendor, because what we're going to learn from Daniel and Paul today is the level of collaboration that an interior designer, a framer, and an artist can have together that ultimately not only serves all three of these entities better, but serves your client better. And we all know every time we serve our client better, it's happy, happy, happy all the way around, both pocketbook and joy, joy factor, right? <laughs> so, Absolutely. right. So, so Daniel, you, you are an interior designer and you are the owner of Chelsea Frames. And you were explained explain to us the relationship and how your particular position with both those perspectives as a designer and a framer what you bring to the table when you work with an artist like paul and you think about creating and framing for his art well you know it, it as as you mentioned luann um framing is really just another aspect of a design interior design project um, I started designing uh, originally in Canada, and I was headhunted and uh, came to the U.S. in the early 90s. And strangely enough, I was I gravitated towards this small frame shop in New York City, which I eventually ended up buying. Um, I continued designing, although I left the firm, the, the prestige firm that I was working with, and I continued working as an interior designer. But it soon became apparent to me that the framing industry was a very, very important aspect of the finishing touches that go into someone's home. Um, Through the years, uh, we've had the privilege of working with 
tremendous other designers and, and artists. My partner, my business partner, Jacqueline, started working with Paul about five years ago. And they formed uh, a great team in presenting Paul's work. We also uh, have a, a gallery that is tied into our, our framing studio uh, called Gallery Protégé. And, and Paul has had many successful shows there. One of the things I learned is that often when we do a design project, whether we're renovating a room or a home, the last finishing touches, which can be the accessories, include uh, the framing that goes with the artwork that is selected. What often happens is the artwork is overlooked and therefore the framing is overlooked. So the install is happening, um, the furniture is coming in, there's nothing to go on the walls. Mm. In some cases, the clients have their own artwork, but it needs to be reframed. It needs to be protected. Um, the, the main purpose of framing is to protect, uh, preserve, and present artwork. And um, as you mentioned, we're just another vendor in that chain, but we're an important vendor, I think, because we come in with the finishing touches that often either dictate whether a room looks finished or it doesn't. And so the thing about it is, is that what you, I can see this as, as a, a, a area that is like, uh oh, at the end, right? <laughs> yep. We have yep. grandma's art or there, you know, but it doesn't, it's, you know, not quite presented as well. And the, th I guess the, the eye opening part for me of the conversation was how instrumental that a knowledgeable framer could be in helping and both an artist and an interior designer make the most of their piece. And so one of the things that we talked about, which I'd love to share with everybody, is how you were recently approached by Larson Jewell to put together their booth presentation at the Art Expo New York that just ended um, recently in April here at New York uh, City. And basically, for anybody who doesn't know, Larson Jewel is a manufacturer of frames, and they're one of the frame vendors that you carry at Chelsea Frames. And because Correct. of your reputation in the industry, they said, would you put this booth together because we trust you and value you and know that you will create an amazing space. And so from there, you reached out to Paul and said, you know, you're this amazing artist, and I want to put your work in there. Now, share with everybody... Um, Paul, do you want to share with everybody, you shared with me something interesting about how he, how Daniel approached the booth and how he framed your art in different ways to effectively display Larson Jewel's product, but to not leave your product as the second fiddle. Right. Uh, well, what Daniel did, which I thought was extraordinary, was he had three groupings of frames, and um, he'll explain the show a little more in depth what he did. But he took my pieces individually and framed them masterfully by, based on each piece, and based on the story and the feeling of each piece. So some of the frames were, um, Daniel, what is the word where it's, they're not floating? Uh, we had floater frames and we had cap frames. Cap frames. So... And each one was done and designed individually. In the end, from the artist's point of view, he took artwork and elevated it to very fine artwork because I learned a long time ago that an important piece of art deserves an important frame. And that's the way I feel about presenting my work. And that's what Daniel and Larson Jewell did with my work. And it was really quite spectacular. And I'll let Daniel explain the, the process that he went through. So essentially, um, Larson Jewel wanted to present three of their new collections. And so there was a physical constraint to the three collections that we would be using. And they were all diametrically different from one another. That said, we had also approached Paul. And my partner Jacqueline is the one who selected the artwork. She went to his studio in Pennsylvania and selected the works with him. But Paul had prepared the, sh the, the artwork um, so that it reflected a, a theme called seasons. And so there were th pieces that represented each season. Um, and so the colors, and Paul uses very vibrant colors and mm. movement and light reflections, the colors also reflected, and you, you could actually feel those seasons. And they were tied in, as Paul said, and as 
it was obvious then looking at the art, each was tied into a story as well. Um, I'll, I'll, memorable, for example, Paul had two pieces from a series called Water, and they were based on uh, trips that he had done to the Caribbean and the Mediterranean, and how the light reflected made the compositions of blues and greens be so different. And in one, the Caribbean, you had light violets and pinks coming through those blues and greens. And the Mediterranean, you had much, they were more vibrant blues. And it, when you saw that and you heard the story, it was, it made complete sense. You could hear so, it, you could see it. You were like, oh, oh yeah, I get it. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Okay. So my challenge was then to take the art and present it the best I could trying to, without sitting down with Paul and getting a written story of each piece, mm -hmm. trying to understand the intent of the piece and the intent of the artist with that piece, um, which is what I would do if a client came in. A client comes in and they have a piece from an artist. I haven't met the artist. I haven't had that conversation. It's my business and it's my knowledge to look at the piece, understand the period the, 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 the piece is from, understand if I know the artist, the intent of the artist. If I don't know the artist, understand by the use of color and movement and, and brush strokes or whatever to define that intent and then pick the best frame. What happens, uh, for example, for Art Expo New York, we were constrained to three collections of frames. But that's our real world because if a designer comes in and we work with designers from at every level, whether it's the new designer, whether it's the mid-career mid designer or very upscale designers, they, a lot of them come to us. They have an aesthetic. And so if I were to propose a white frame to designer XYZ, he would say, never, Not in ever, my jobs. ever going to happen. Right. I don't care how good it looks, you know, hanging on the wall. It's not going exactly. into my rooms. Not okay. Quite. Exactly. The other designer will say it has to be 22 karat gold or nothing else. <laughs> so the, the real world is constrained that way. And it's our job to then interpret that, interpret the art and say, these are the best, this is the best solution for this piece of art. Okay. So what you're describing is that because Larson Jewell specifically wanted to feature three different collections, that is the same as you being, you know, put into a box by a designer or a client. Absolutely. Who, okay, so I understand that. I like that. Absolutely. Okay, and I just have to say, you know, I don't know if everybody heard it in there. And, of course, if you have listened to my show, you may have listened last year to the episode with Charles Pavarini where he described Paul Thomas's work, and so you're familiar with his work. But if you're not, you need to go and look at – I'll put pictures up on the website and so forth. But I don't know if you heard it in there – Paul literally said that he said that the artist's work is elevated by what the framer does with it. And I'm just like, wait, if the artist thinks that his work is elevated by the frame, that's pretty significant. I mean, I, I just, to me, that's a... I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that's very giving on your part, Paul, because I, I not to take away, obviously, Daniel, I'm learning the level of complexity and talent that's required to really p present and feature the right frame for the art. But I would have thought that the artist was <laughs> sort of the, you know, the, the main thing. And it's just amazing that here's Paul saying that my art relies on what a, a quality frame or knowledgeable framer can do to it to make it the best it could be. That's pretty significant. Well, well and trust me as a, sorry, Paul, go ahead. <clears throat> he, he, first of all, it's not, yes, the framer is very important. But also in this case, in the case of Daniel, the interior designer is important because, you know, as an artist, I have a vision of my work and where I think it will go and how it will be placed. But the interior designers have such an incredible vision and it's that collaboration. So, um, no, it makes a huge difference in work. And anybody who doesn't believe it has never had their work properly framed. Because mm. <laughs> what you're saying, I mean, look, Paul, you are truly talented. And so what you're really you. saying is that you can be absolutely thrilled and happy and proud of the, a piece that you've created. But your eyes get opened when you work with somebody like Daniel or Charles Pavarini or Robin Barron and get their take on how the frame could then inform the piece. That's what you're saying. 
Of course. I mean, yes. I, I'm, I'm one element. I create the paintings, mm -hmm. but the paintings require an environment. And uh, to, have, to have your work in the hands of professionals, to have it framed so beautifully, details happened in the framing that I would never have thought of. Mm. And now it's something that I think of going forward. Okay. So I, it's a learning experience. And not only that, I will tell you that people stopped at the Art Expo and they commented on the frames. Mm. And that is not something that normally happens unless they're, they're very well framed. And Daniel, let me ask you a question. I'm going to go on a limb here because I don't know the answer to this. So I'm going to put you on the spot. Is it part of what like I, I know you just told us that you will work with designers at all levels of their career. Is it part of the process for you when a designer comes to you, whether they're at the beginning, middle or end, but if the this idea, this concept of really taking careful attention to the framing, is it is it possible, is it feasible that you'll guide them and teach them and walk them through so that they can learn to develop that aesthetic that Paul is talking about, how an artist brings more? Because they can come in and rely on you for it. It's and But do you take the time to explain and teach a, a, a designer the value in them developing their eye for selecting a frame? Absolutely. Okay, you know, how do you go think, about doing that? What, what does that look like when a designer comes to your shop and they have a piece and they say, you know, I'm not that knowledgeable about this. And I, I, they could be, you know, the most famous designer in New York City and they might just look at you and say, this isn't my thing. What, how can you help me? How do you do that with them, Daniel? Sure. And, and first of all, I think it's important to share, Luann, that the reason I do it, to me, knowledge is worthless unless you can share it. Mm. And the pleasure um, and the experience that I have in the framing industry, especially with the baggage of being an interior designer, mm -hmm. to, to me, my greatest pleasure is being able to take a piece and make it look its best. So that said, you know, when a designer comes in and to your point, they say, hey, this isn't my thing. I don't know what to do here. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing I'll ask them, OK, tell me about, about the story. Tell me about your clients. Where is it going? What's the, you know, what, right. what, what do you want to achieve with this piece of art? In some cases, it's like, well, I have to, I have to use this piece because of X, Y, Z. Right. And it just has to look the best it can. That's, a, that's, a, that's an easy, that's an easy um, goal to accomplish because I'll say, okay, this piece is from this era or from this. It's a portrait. It's this. We could do this, this, and this. Um, tell me about the finishes you're using in the room. Tell me about the fabrics. Tell me about the color story. Mm. You know, are you using one type of metal throughout the, the, the project? Are you mixing metals? So these are questions that I'll use to draw out as much as I can, um, regardless of the, the designer's experience and regardless of the designer's input, mm. just to get So that you can be best. informed. Exactly. Yes. And to get to the, to, you know, I had a client come into our shop, I want to say three, four weeks ago. And who I had worked with years ago, and they've, they've moved to a new loft, and this is a piece of art they had been given, and they didn't particularly love, but the person it came from was so important to them that they wanted to put this piece up. Hmm. The, piece, the piece, however, was six feet by five feet, not a small piece of art. Whoa. And so I'm trying to get more information on their, you know, I know them and I know their aesthetic, but... This is going into the, and they're moving it from their country house to their city house. And I'm thinking, what, what direction are you going? And I don't want to, to delve into people's private lives too much. But at a certain point, <laughs> they just dropped the word mid-century. You know, that it, they felt at this point in their life, they wanted to get rid of the frou-frou and they were going a little bit more mid-century. And then I just went to the wall and picked out the frame and I said, I think okay. this is going to fit the bill. Okay. And they said, "Oh my god. That's it. You've nailed it." <laughs> we couldn't we couldn't we couldn't see it. A little, you know, a Steve Jobs moment, they'll know it. <laughs> people don't know what they want when they see it. Yes. Well, they the minute I put that frame sample on the piece, they said, "Done. That's it. Right. That's what right. we want. That's exactly what we wanted." We couldn't describe it. So, it's my job to listen. It's right. not my job to talk. Talking right. now, but right. <laughs> when I'm in the set of of the the framing gallery, it's my job to listen 
and to then deliver. I, I think it's I think it's terrific because the truth is I I'm hoping that there's a designer out there listening that's thinking about this in a new way and thinking because from a business standpoint let's just go here for a moment if a designer is on a project and like you said nobody's really thinking about the artwork maybe it's because the client has what and I, we don't even necessarily need to be thinking about a curated collection of art we could be thinking about their just their art that they've got on their own that may or may not be expensive or not expensive but if there's an assumption all around that the artwork that was in the house is going to stay in the house, a designer really could think about how this could be a little another revenue avenue for them by actually suggesting that it be reframed and livened up and freshened up and so forth. And when you think about a process like this where you might really be taking a pre piece of art that could be so much better featured with a more appropriate frame – you 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 it's a it's a win win because you're creating revenue for your firm but you're also you know highlighting that art and creating a better piece that the client had from before to going ahead so and what i like is that you know unfortunately not everybody that listening is in the new york city area but I like that, you know, Daniel, that your shop is here and that you're willing to help and teach. And I like that you come from an interior design background because you speak the language and you understand that maybe the fabric that's in the room is important to it. So it's not like, look, I've framed a lot of pieces of my own through the years. And normally I get no help at all. You know what I mean? You, right. you're, your typical experience with framing is, okay, lady, there's the wall. Pick what you want. <laughs> right. yeah, I can't even imagine having an educated, you know, talented design you know knowledgeable frame expert helped me do it <laughs> and you know our whole our whole design team is trained to work that way with designers so mm. it's not just myself or my partner Jacqueline you know we have um, three other designers on the floor and we have two other people that can do backup uh, design work so anyone that comes to the shop will be taken care of in, the, in, in that way that's not an issue and just as a side note we do offer trade discounts okay so um you know we just obviously set up an account like like any vendor would do and that allows also the designer to be paid for their work right and is the designer free to come in with their client and all of you collaborate together but you still present absolutely. the trade pricing right exactly uh, absolutely. right yeah. so they don't have to so, do it outside of the because a lot of people you know obviously understandably so are uh, art is emotional and if you're taking the time to reframe it it's probably because it's important to you and so it's very logical that the client might want to be part of that process so yeah, that's that's absolutely. awesome okay so do you want to tell us a little bit more about the three different styles of collections that Larson Jewel, you know, imposed upon you and how you worked your magic with Paul's art? Sure. Um, so the three collections were diametrically really different from one another. Uh, one collection is called Salzburg. And the collection um, essentially were a modern take on empire style profiles. So quite, quite classical um, in their finishes, beautiful black rubbed, hand rubbed finishes over silvers with some distressing on the wood and then a beautiful silver leaf uh, as well in that, in that um, uh, profile. So that collection had 10 profiles um, that we chose from. The second collection was called Havana and they were burls, uh, wood burls, which um, were done in in a smoky cognac color and in a beautiful rich amber color. The third collection is called H4 and it had handcrafted, hand applied uh, aluminum on um, stained, walnut stained and whitewashed wood. Jeez. And uh, that collection was based on the Spruce Goose uh, that uh, Howard Hughes built. So we had three very often, very, you know, completely different collections. Right. And what was interesting, the floater frames, um, we also mounted Paul's photographs in very different ways. In some cases, we left a lot of space. We left the maximum space on the floater. Um, the brush stroke is so elegant and tells such a story. And that punctuation cannot be contained and it has to flow. And so 
on the floater frames, we often gave as much space as we could so that the art just literally flowed and reflected into this aluminum that was hand hammered onto the frames. Mm. Uh, in some cases, we mounted the art on a one inch strainer bar. So it was it was quite heavy and apparent in the frame. In other cases, we used a half inch stretcher bar. So it was a little bit more discreet. And Paul noticed the nuances, which was very interesting. I thought it was interesting <laughs> that, that he noticed them and he said, it works. It, it, they're different and it works. Um, some were cap frames, to, as Paul mentioned at the beginning of, the, of our discussion. And the idea with that is that in some cases, Paul obviously captured a moment of light, a moment of an expression, a moment mm. of almost a portraiture and the cap just seized that moment. And so it stopped it. And again, he said, he says, how did you figure that out? And I said, well, I can see it in your work. I can see that you've, you've created um, almost uh, an invisible vanishing point, but it's not going off the canvas, it's going into the canvas. <laughs> And um, on, on with the Havana, which was a little trickier because um, the, the, the burl could have been very heavy, but we enhanced it with hand gilded, uh, what we call fillets, which are, are small insets that go into frames. And it just created this illusion of light and reflection. And Paul said, oh my God, what have you done? That's, that's just, it's like magic going on in that frame. So I, <laughs> I, I have to say, I was deeply touched and deeply pre appreciative that I was humbly able to present the work as as well as we were because I mean Paul's work as you know is fantastic. Well, it's and... funny cuz I'm just sitting here thinking to myself, you know, and about to ask Paul, what an extraordinary experience to work with someone like Daniel who seems to understand, care, and value what you've created probably as much as you do. I mean, it's just remarkable. <laughs> it is. It's an extraordinary experience. <clears throat> I mean, you can hear it in his voice. I mean, <clears throat> instead of like, well, that color and this color and put it together, that'll look awesome. It's like, <laughs> what well, was that like for that, you, Paul? Yeah, you know, it's actually inspiring and it makes me want to go to the next level with my work. Um, and it also brings in that creative element. You know, as an artist, you work very solo. It's, you have to work in your studio alone. But then to have the same piece of work handed over to another design professional, and then ultimately it will go to an interior designer right. who will put it into their work. Uh, it's very gratifying. It's the complete circle of design and art, and that's what I strive for. It's, so it's, it's really something art. else. It really is. You know, there is. was one piece. There was mm -hmm. one piece. If, if, if you're okay with me telling this little anecdote, Paul, mm -hmm. there was one piece that Paul had said to us, please crop this piece at X by Y. Right. Now, I had the raw canvas, and my partner, Jacqueline, who had selected the work with Paul in his studio, said, yeah, Paul, for some reason, just really wanted this cropped. Mm -hmm. And I said, I love it had on one side a chartreuse, you know, this really strong chartreuse line. And on the other side, this vibrant mint green. And I said, it's really, there's something about this piece. I can't crop it. It's uh -oh. just going against <laughs> everything. And I said, I said to Jacqueline, do you think Paul will mind? Not only do I not crop it, but in the, and it was the Havana, it was the dark burl. I added an olive green inset which was a different green from the piece. And I said, you know, if he hates it, we'll cut it all down. And right. so Paul sees the piece and he says, oh, my God. And I'm thinking, oh, crap, what have uh -oh. I done? Uh-oh, we're says, in trouble. He gave us one requirement and we went against was, it. <laughs> he says that piece was completely out of balance. And I, I hated the fact that it was out of balance. And somehow by strapping it with that olive green, it's like, it's finished. Oh, it I completed, can finish it. It completed the composition in a way that I I hadn't done for myself. Isn't that and so that's good. the art of framing. That is the art of working with a professional. Well, in everything we do, right? We, if you work with somebody who really knows their business, it just brings everything that you've brought to the table up another level, which is what you've been saying, Paul. I, I, to me, I'm, I'm a little like with my mouth wide open, I have to say. <laughs> I mean, I'm, 
look, I'm not an interior designer. Everybody knows it, but you know, rubbing elbows with you guys for 30 years. And this is an eye opening conversation, truly. And I just think about the possibilities, which is why I was so excited to do this because I think of, if I were a designer out there and I was overlooking this whole aspect of a project, I would be like, oh, I, ha I have to, it just, like I said, I, you know me, I always think of it from a business standpoint first, but it is something that you can fold right into your design and your project but when you work with somebody like Daniel who really knows or an artist like Paul who's gracious and is open to the fact that as a designer, what will be your addition to what I've created, that just is exciting. That's a, that's a, Forget the money that you could make on it. I mean, but that's exciting. How fun. I mean, and that's what the whole yeah. point of the conversation is too, is if you're not in the New York area, you know, there are – you have to align yourself with artists and framers and, you know, collaborators who all each understand that you as a designer have something to bring to the table, that it's not just all about, I mean, how about that, that giving right there, Paul literally sees the piece in a certain way, requests that it be cropped in a certain way, but is willing to step back and say, geez, that's even better than what I did. You finished my piece. That's, that's pretty remarkable. I love that. That's really it, awesome. It, it is. And it was, yes. Thank mm -hmm. you, Paul. Yeah. It, it, and it was a great <laughs> moment for us because I saw the piece through, you know, at a certain point, an artist um, doesn't, can't let go of a piece or doesn't want to let go of a piece. Right. Or or for whatever reason. Or maybe they're a prima um, donna about it or a diva. No, you know but it's, it, could be, it, 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 it is be it anything. is very emotional. Sure. It is very, it is, an artist goes through a heart-wrenching, gut-wrenching, um, emotional time. To and this is their it. baby. Yeah, that's what I was saying. It's like you, I, I, I have to believe that an artist is attached to every piece that he or she creates at that really gut level because it is a process. It is like you yep. just said, it's an emotional, you cannot create the things at least that Paul creates without it being very deep inside of you and coming out onto the canvas. You know, Paul said something very interesting on the weekend when we were at the show, you know, where people have approached him and said, oh, my, my child could do that. And Paul said, but could they do it twice? <laughs> <laughs> ah, that's awesome, Paul. <laughs> what, what we haven't said is, is I'm an abstract expressionist. Yes. So my paintings are devoid of imagery, right. but they're filled with emotion and movement. They are. And what's nice is that people – People get the feeling. They actually get the story behind the painting without me having to tell it. And, you know, one of my heroes is Mark Rothko, who said that a painting, abstract expression painting, is as good as the interaction that the viewer has with it. Mm. And, you know, the, the viewing of a painting is a complete package. And that package includes framing, it includes lighting, it includes environment. So that's why interior designers are actually my favorite people to work with, be mm. it framers or designers. Right. Did Very somebody exciting. really say that to you at the show, my kid could have done that? Oh, I get that all the time. That's, I, that's, I mean, who raised that person? How, you know well, what I'm, I'm saying? Sure, I'm sure... I'm sure a lot of parents have said that about Jackson Pollock's work as well. But not so to the man. Up. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I can understand. I mean, in, in all fairness, in all fairness to the people who came to the booth, Paul told me the story on the weekend. It did not actually happen this weekend. Oh, so okay, the people okay. who all came to New York yeah, were was lovely. Too. If you're listening, you were all lovely. Okay, yeah, it was, okay. It was a very appreciative audience, yes. Because I got to say, I, I mean, I think that's a great comeback, and you know, but can he do it twice? But I think my comeback might have been like a fistful of knuckles. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you kidding me, lady? <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's something else. So – um, Daniel, has there is there anything else that we should cover uh, for our colleagues, the designers listening in this process of – so say they don't have the ability. Say somebody – like this show is going to 120 countries. Say they don't have the ability to come into Chelsea Frames in New York City and work with you or some of your designers on staff. What are some tips that you could share 
for them going and working with a framer and trying to maybe ask a series of questions where they could discern if this framer has the same passion and talent? Like what are some of the, the things that they should look for and ask about? Well, first of all, I'm just going to put this out there, Luann, because we work with designers all over the country and we work with designers all over the world. So, How do you do that? You know, I mean, it, they have it, to... It works. I mean, people ship you... to us, you know... Really? I've shipped things... Oh, yeah, absolutely. But I would think absolutely. that if a designer, like, say, from San Francisco had a project in Manhattan, then, yes, I could say that you see that you would say you work with designers all over. But a designer in San Francisco can have a project and what? Send you pictures, photographs of the room, of the art, and ask your advice and then ship the piece to you to be framed? Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh we, we've done that. We've done that and we do it regularly. So that is not a problem. Okay. If anyone wants to work with us, it's out there. Reach out to us and, and we will do the best we can to make it work for you. Okay. That said, you know, I mean, there are times where it isn't, it, it is just not possible. The budget you know, won't allow things, or timing. Exactly. Or shipping, shipping can get expensive. Yes. Um, what I suggest is, you know, get to know your framer. Um, if, if you are in a city, um, there are framers that um, have the ability. I mean, I know framers all over the country and I, there are some that if I had a project to do, I would go to them. Okay. You know, if I could, if I couldn't do it myself, there are sources like Larson Jewel, uh, for example, in the industry who okay. are able to direct, um, clients, you know, to the by more referral talented. System. Okay. That's a great resource. Yeah, I, I mean, like that. You know, talented is, is a, is a big word. Right. Um, you know, I, I think you know what I'm devoted uh, is your, the word I would use to, for you. Yeah, You're devoted. I would say devoted <laughs> and and willing to work. There are people who are very talented in many industries, but who are not willing to work with just anyone. Right. And who set their own standards. That's something at Chelsea Frames. We that's not our philosophy. That's not our design philosophy. We work with anyone who wants to work with us, and that's to me that's our passion. Right. And there are other frame shops globally. I have worked uh, um, globally uh, and gone into frame shops in, in France, in the UK, in Italy. And I, I, you can feel right away when someone is there to work for you. And I have a short list of who I would use if I was in France, if I was in the Netherlands, if I was in Germany, if I was in London. Um, I've been to their shops. I've seen their passion. And so, you know, get to know your framer. Okay. Ask questions. Um, Can I share my experience with um, framing? Actually, it started with Chelsea Frames five years ago mm -hmm. when I did my first show in their gallery, Gallery Protégé. Uh, I'm an artist, first of all, who only presents work that is framed because for my aesthetic, work is not finished unless it's framed. And Willem de Kooning is the person who taught me that. So mm. if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but I have to tell you what happened, the experience was, was really, was quite wonderful. I brought the work in prior to the show to have it framed. And Jacqueline actually took the time to present a whole number of frames with me. We must have spent an hour and a half between works on paper and canvas work so my advice to people, if you don't have a Chelsea Frames and you don't have the expertise of a Chelsea Frames, is you become the expert by going in and making the time. Ask to see lots of different samples of framing and what it will look like next to the work. Because Jacqueline, I think she knew what she wanted right away because of her expertise in the art field and in the framing field, but she made me feel comfortable. And I actually ended up going with frames that were a lot more expensive than what my original thought was mm. because they were the right thing to do. Okay. And so... And I think that... You, no, go yeah, ahead. That would be my suggestion. My suggestion is take your time. If you're not willing to invest the time in a frame shop, you know, going to a frame shop with your piece of art is not five minutes buying eggs at the grocery store. Okay, right. Good point. Would you agree, Daniel? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Very good point. Good point. And so I guess what we're saying is that there's probably an immediate impression of going into a frame shop if the 
um, designer there, the owner there, whoever it may be, is willing to be, like I said, you know, here, lady, there's the well pick or helpful a part of the process. So that's a that's an that's immediate, scary. I'm yeah. sorry, but that's oh, scary. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but that's an immediate. You know, you know, just turn around and walk out the door. You're in the wrong place, sweetie. Right. But beyond that, you're saying that you could reach out to the industry frame vendors themselves and see if they have anybody that they like and and respect and could recommend in your area. And I'm also realizing that in talking, uh, you know, about Paul's experience is even if you haven't been able to find the frame person to work with through other avenues if you go into the artist community it sounds like if you go into the different galleries and find the artists and see who they respect the way paul respects you right Mm -hmm. okay and then lastly i'm just going to put you on the spot since you mentioned that you have so many prime contacts all over the world if a designer would like a referral from another part of the country or the world, Daniel, are you open to somebody reaching out and calling you and asking you for a Absolutely. recommendation? Okay. Absolutely. I love it. Absolutely. I'd be happy. I love it. I think it's yeah. – I, I, I can see that um, – well, I, I mean, look, I can see the – value in being able to work with you directly but we also do know that some projects have limitations and constraints that that would not be available to everybody but even if you know a designer is listening in another part of the country i have to tell you i'm going to put you on the spot again but this has got me so intrigued this relationship that i had no idea goes on between the artist the designer the framer that if I were listening and say I'm in Oklahoma and I know I'm making a trip to New York City sometime, I'm telling you what, I would be, Daniel, emailing you and saying, I heard you on the podcast. Can I come into your shop and just you talk know what? with you? I'm willing to give you I'm willing to give everyone my email address right now. Yeah, I, I think that, I mean that's what I would be doing. I'm like, okay, hubby, we're coming to we're going to New York, but I need an hour to spend at Daniel's you know, Chelsea frames. <laughs> I'll take that as a no on giving my email address. No, no, on your show. Uh, no, we're gonna do it. We're gonna if you want sure. to, we're going to for sure. Sure. Yeah. Daniel no, I was just, at ChelseaFrames.com. That's I'd be easy happy enough. To answer any questions. Yeah. No, I was just going to wait until we signed off. But yeah. <laughs> no, I just, you know what? I'm, I'm, it's intriguing to me. And I just keep thinking about, like I said, I'm repeating myself, but I think about how, and you know what? I'm going to p- take it a different way. I'm thinking about how if I were a new or emerging designer, that I could sort of, you know, make this one of my expertises, that I really Mm -hmm. took the time to learn this end of it and really be an expert the way you are, Daniel, in showcasing an artist's work and making the most of a frame. And then that could be one of the things that I speak to my clients about, that, yes, I'm going to design your room and it's going to be amazing, but you got to see what I'm going to do with your artwork. You know, I've got this skill set down. And just uh, really developing that. I think it's awesome. It's just something that never occurred to me as a Absolutely. avenue. Yeah, I think it's terrific. You know, in, in some cases, I've worked with designers, really high-end designers in, in New York City, who actually create the room around the artwork mm. or around, you know, thematically, it could be, you know, a grouping of photographs of children, family photographs, or, mm. or those elements become, they're so important. They're so signature for that designer um, the way that, that he or she handles a project, that it's a given. The project, you know, is six, eight months from completion, but that artwork is with us. It's getting framed, and it's going – it's ready to be consolidated so that – because it's such an important right. feature – in that designer's uh, world. Right. So, For some designers, it's not the afterthought. It's literally as important as the sofas and the chairs and the yep. lamps. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. I think it's amazing. So I'm going to have to put up on our website the pictures of some of the this the booth that you guys did so that everybody can see the Havana frames and, you know, all the different things and, and of course, Paul's artwork and so forth. Um, and I'll put the links in the show notes and everything too. But this has been a fun, eye-opening interview for me. Probably half the designers are like, Lynn, we all knew this. We know we have to work with a good person. But... <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, I thought it was cool. <laughs> I, you know it's what it just is? been reinforced. Well, you know what it is? I'm hearing, like I said, I use the word devotion. I can hear your devotion, Daniel, into uh, really making the most of the experience, not only for the designer, the client, but the artist as well. And I can hear in Paul, you know, his appreciation for that. It is, you know, your, your artwork is very important to you. It comes from your soul. It comes from your being. And to know that somebody values it the way that you do has got to be just absolutely a, a phenomenal experience. You know? It really is. It really is. My, my message to other designers out there is that when you're dealing with artists, uh, explain to them the importance and the value of framing because it really makes a difference. Mm -hmm. And until an artist actually sees it, as you said earlier, some people are very controlling about their work, but another talented eye never hurts. Mm. Yeah, well, you're just a a giving soul, Paul. I knew that from the first time I met you. It's just so clear. No and, joke. And, a, and a pleasure and a treasure to work with. It's the True. truth. It's the truth. So. Well, Thanks. you guys, <laughs> now he's blushing. We just, just love each other so much. <laughs> exactly. uh, I'm blushing. I'm, thank God this is, a, this is a, uh, an audio. <laughs> you know, it's anyway, true, though. You. It is true, though, Paul. It is absolutely true. So I I just thank you so much, both of you, for coming on the show and sharing your passion and your expertise on this subject with us. And hopefully, you know, I wouldn't be surprised, Daniel, if you get some people reaching out to you and wanting to come to the shop and, and really experience firsthand, you know, the creation of and the completion of seeing an artwork come to fruition with the, the right frame and the right aesthetic applied to it. So I it'll thank be, you. It'll be my pleasure. Yeah, awesome. Well, I thank you again. Have a great day. Thank you, Luan. Thank Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. My great thanks to the featured sponsor of our podcast, Kravit Inc. Of all the terrific things about Kravit, do you know about curatedkravit.com? I know you've heard me tell you all about it for this last year and a half, but have you taken a minute to really go and look and check out curatedkravit.com yet? You have to see this collection of the most unique, high-quality finished products for the home. The collection includes furniture, lighting, bedding, rugs, accessories, and more. It is so comprehensive. It features customized designs as well as unique hand-picked pieces from the global design market. CuratedKravit.com is available exclusively to the trade. That's right. No direct consumer purchasing. They have your back at Kravit Inc. And have you checked out the innovative ready-to-ship upholstery program? This is groundbreaking in our industry. Where else can you find someone that delivers custom quality furniture fast? I'll tell you where else. Nowhere else. You see, it's the combination, custom quality and fast. That is at curatedkravit.com. You can shop the site by product category, by stylized product stories, and through the curated rooms designed by the industry tastemakers. At curatedkravit.com, they are committed to making your job more efficient by providing unmatched customer service coupled with an exceptional product offering. Kravit Inc. stands firm in their mission to serve the interior design trade at the very highest level. And the last and one of the most fabulous features is the process is so simple. That's right. Design, click, delivered. Easy as that. One last thing. Kravit Inc. has a thank you to you as a listener of the podcast. If you are on the site and you are ready to make a purchase, any one purchase, you can get 10% off as their thanks to you. Enter the code CKPODCAST at checkout for 10% off any one purchase. Well, I do thank them very much, and I really do hope that you will take a moment to see how curatedkravit.com can help you run your business more efficiently. 
So I'll just let you know that during most of this interview, I was thinking about my friend, Jen Meyer. Hi, Jen. How are you? <laughs> Jen is an interior designer here in New Jersey. And Jen has a particular talent and eye for, ha- for artwork. She has, you know, been an interior designer for many years, but she's also worked in art galleries in New York City over the years as well. And it's always so much fun to see the artwork that Jen introduces into her projects. So I bet she's been to Chelsea Frames. I'll have to ask her the next time I see her. What about you? Did you realize the effect that the right frame can have on your client's art? I mean, when an accomplished artist like Paul Thomas so freely praises and acknowledges the value that framing adds to his pieces, well, I'm just going to say that's saying something. And aren't if you aren't sure about that, go to our website at www.windowworks-nj.com because we've included with this podcast post several pictures of Paul's work. And I believe Daniel, by the way, I believe he welcomes you into Chelsea Frames, even if you are unskilled at combining art and frames if you are new to it. His mission is so clearly to help you and guide you and educate you on how to make the most of your opportunity to add fine art to your projects. So don't hesitate if you are in the area or if you are planning a trip from out of town into the New York City area, please take him up on his offer and arrange a visit to Chelsea Frames. You can contact Daniel at email at chelseaframes.com. So a few housekeeping notes. One week from today, I will be at the brand new, spanking brand new Kravitz showroom on the 12th floor at the D&D building in New York City. They're having a party over there from 2 o'clock to 5 o'clock, and they invited me to come. And so, of course, I'm inviting all of you to come. (laughs) So I don't know if they realize all of you might be coming, but I... The heck with that. Let's just all pound down on the showroom and see what happens when we get there, right? Now, if you can't come, if you're not in the local area, between 2 and 5 p.m. Eastern time, keep checking your Facebook because we're going to be doing some Facebook Live shenanigans from Kravitz Showroom. So um, it'd be fun for you to kind of talk with us and interact with us during the live Facebook feed, okay? Now, before I sign off today, I want to say two things. Number one, if you're not sure of it, if you don't realize it and hadn't heard the news, Kelsey Gross from the Farmer's Daughters Interiors is guest posting on our To The Trade blog. She is um, coming in about once a month or so and doing posts on that first year in business. And so Kelsey's post is live on the blog. So make sure you go there. I also have a post recently that went up a couple of weeks ago about social media for your interior design. So it's a resource there for you guys on running your business and from from different perspectives, okay, both from an experienced designer perspective and a new designer perspective. And the last thing that I want to do before I leave today is I know that many of you uh, listen to the podcast while you drive during the day, back and forth to clients, back and forth picking up your kids. I did the same thing when my kids were young. And recently, my friend Veronica Solomon was talking with us on Facebook, and she was saying how her two kids listen to the podcast practically as much as she does, and that at some point, they're probably going to be able to run her into your design firm (laughs) based on listening to all the great advice from all the guests that we have on the show. So I wanted to give a huge shout out to Joshua and Courtney and tell them I'm so delighted to have you guys as listeners to the podcast. They not only listen to the show with Veronica, but they also catch Rachel Moriarty's daily riffs on her Facebook lives. So if any of you designers are somehow at this point still unaware of Veronica Solomon or Rachel Moriarty, I mean, I talk about them both constantly. They're good to check out, check out their websites, check out their Facebook uh, feeds. Particularly, they're doing a great job in marketing their business in every way, but in particularly Facebook. So these are designers to emulate and to sort of watch what they're doing and see if you can do the same things. But in the meantime, thanks kids for listening. So happy to have you along. All righty. Um, lastly, lastly, lastly. Lots of new iTunes reviews came in. I do appreciate it so much. Recent ones were from Brooks Interiors and Kathleen Jennison. And all I can tell you is they make my day. They just make me smile. They make me so happy. They make me so proud that we are really reaching and accomplishing and helping you do what it is that you do every day. So uh, thank you very much. All righty, guys. Have an excellent day.
Thank you for joining me again today for another episode of A Well-Designed Business. This podcast is a production of Window Works in Livingston, New Jersey, your trade resource for custom window treatments and awnings. Learn more about Window Works at www.windowworks-nj.com. All of our music is original music by Room 2 Productions. Please contact us if you want to learn more about original music for your business or your events. Thank you.